Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Psychosocial Distancing Podcast. Uh, I'm Daniel Chadbourne and I am joined with my co-host. Thomas Brooks, it's good to be back. Yes, it is. Uh, we're, we're a little, little late this week trying to stay on schedule, but uh, we're going to start delving into chapter two of the uh, Principles of Social Psychology. We're going to talk a little bit about automatic processing, social cognition, um, predominantly automatic processing, biases, schemas, heuristics, all that stuff that is influenced by the social environment and gets us into trouble if we don't keep it in check. You know, the, the, the idea that we're supposed to use these automatic processes and then self-correct, but we don't always go to step two. <laughs> and also a little bit about how our environments reinforce those automatic processes and how they can possibly be manipulated. <laughs> So yeah, so with that on the docket, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about, I have a story to share with Thomas to kind of emphasize some of these points. Um, Thomas has an article to share with me that kind of combines some of the stuff that we were originally going to talk about, um, as well as uh, talking a little bit about uh, uh, Freud's nephew and uh, social cognition in the advertising sphere. Um, and then I've got this, this, I call it the big old bias list. Uh, it's it's a list of about 130, I think there are 136, 130 something uh, some odd biases that were put together by a, um, a graduate student that the, we were both uh, attending for a class and they, they sort of shared it around as their final paper for the class. And um, I'm going to, I mean, we obviously can't cover all 136 um, biases, but what I, what I might do is just uh, use a random number generator and we'll talk about a couple of uh, kind of off-the-wall biases. So with that, I, I want to start with this story. And, and I think this story emphasizes, I, I think the story itself emphasizes a, a, a great example of how our own, I don't want to say biases, but our own kind of automatic thinking tied to our environment, what we're currently thinking about, what's currently on our mind, the news that we're exposed to, how we perceive other news sources, uh, and a number of factors kind of comes together to influence how some people view the actions of another on Twitter. And then also, I, I think it would be a really good way to show how uh, our processes can be influenced as I tell the story and then ask you, Thomas, to tell me what did NPR tweet? Oh, man. <laughs> so, so I will give you some hints. And, and as we go through, I'll kind of reveal a little more because this, this happened about three years ago, um, this month. And uh, NPR sent out um, around a little over 100 tweets. Oh, <clears throat> Bit by bit, they were tweeting something. And there were some people, this was in 2017, who got a little upset because they because... felt. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was about to say, it's 2017. Everybody's a little upset. <laughs> right. I mean, it's not 2020 yet, but it's 2017, summer. Um, Donald Trump is in the White House. And there are some supporters of his, or at least perceived supporters of his, who get very upset at NPR because they're tweeting phrases. And, um, and, and so they were not happy. The, the, this is a Business Insider article. I will link it with, the, um, with the, the podcast on YouTube and wherever else, we, wherever else I can uh, post it. So, so here are some of the tweets, and I'm not going to tell you right off the bat what NPR is tweeting. I'll, I'll give you some of the responses first. Okay. So, so, NPR is calling for a revolution. Interesting way to condone violence while trying to sound patriotic. Your implications oh. are clear. Um, in, in response to them tweeting out that you can listen to the tweets that they're given. Uh, one Twitter user replied, I'm glad you're being defunded. You have never been a balanced, uh, you have never been balanced on your show. I can see like the, the wheels turning in your head right now. Oh man. Okay. One woman responded with, please stop. This is not the right place. 
basically asking them to stop making these tweets. They're inappropriate for NPR to put on Twitter. Please be chill at NPR. <laughs> and another uh, uh, Twitter user said, yes, NPR journalists with a mission, trying to claim that NPR is being overtly biased to the incoming or the current at this point Trump administration. After a series of four tweets, uh, this one gentleman responds with, and with Obama out of the White House, may freedom ring again. Okay, so I'll, there, there are more calls for fake, fake news. Right, yeah. Um, and I mean, like, part of the confusion is, is that, you know, when I hear someone calling for revolution, NPR is not at the top of my list. Yeah. Um, geez, what, and it, is it, <clears throat> can I get one, can I ask one question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it, was it topical to July 2017? Yes. Oh, man. Um, uh, not necessarily 2017, though. It was just very topical for the month. For the month? Yeah, so, so here, here's another one. Uh, propaganda is all you know how. Um, or it, propaganda is that all you know how. Try supporting a man who wants to do something about the injustice in this country. And so I'll, I'll, I'll read you the series of tweets that got the, the Obama um, out of the White House, may freedom ring again. And, and then I, I want to read you the line that got a fake news from Senator Meow. Um, which Senator has a, Meow? Senator Meow, which is, he's, got a, a, meow. Yeah, he's got a Meowth in a suit. Which also, at oh. some point, we should talk about the research that shows that if your avatar is an anime character, you're not taken as seriously online. Um, shocker so so here's here's what they here's what they um they 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 tweeted before someone said that because obama's out of the white house may freedom ring again the unanimous declaration of the 13 united states of america when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political brands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth Wait, were they just tweeting the Declaration of Independence? Yes, they were tweeting the Declaration of Independence. Just tweet by tweet? Just tweet by tweet. And, and it, that... They, they, they got a fake news in response to the tweet that all men are created equal. Oh, of course they did. <laughs> so, and there were people who pointed out, you know, so that person who said that, you know, is it propaganda all you know? Someone's like, they're, they're, they're just tweeting the Declaration of Independence. But, but it, it, it kind of goes to where if you're kind of coming in this in a bubble, I mean, I, it kind of almost reminds me of the, the kind of War of the Worlds broadcast that, that, that you know, people mm -hmm. listening to it have to look to their environment for cues. And if you miss that first um, tweet that said, hey, we're going to be tweeting the Declaration of Independence today line by line uh, right. over, over 100 tweets, and you just see NPR making these comments, there's something about kind of like the internal connections when you hear someone say, you know, a prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be a ruler of free people. Uh, <laughs> um, they, they suddenly think that NPR is tweeting about President Trump. And so oh. there's this this kind of interesting kind of schematic connection that, that on one hand, you know, it, it, it could be that maybe they're making some assumptions themselves, but also they would assume that anyone who wants to make a comment about it must be arguing against them, must be trying right. to demean them in some way. Well, um, also these people probably already perceive the NPR as the enemy. So... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, you know, that that's, it's, it is a bias. I mean, it kind of ties in what we're talking about the hostile media effect or hostile media bias. Mm -hmm. And that uh, it doesn't really matter what the person is writing. If you just change, you know, NPR to Fox news, to MSNBC, to CNN, you suddenly mm -hmm. get a different perception of, of whether or not the, they're being legit or they're uh, being kind or, or mean spirited towards your particular candidate. 
Um, and yeah, there, there's just there's just a bunch more that just follow this. That a bunch of people got upset, um, and and we could sometimes see this. There was uh, what was trending the other day. You know, Chris Evans is over party, and everyone was really trying to figure out why Captain America was being canceled. Um, right. But it it turns out there's another Chris Evans in the UK who's done some stuff, and they were working. Oh. On, they were working on bringing to light some of um, that person's details, and and so. But again, oh. you know, if you're an American, you you don't know about British Chris Evans, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know about American Chris Evans, and and that's the only Chris Evans that's important to us. And and so, you know, what thought comes to your mind first in terms of things like that availability heuristic? you know, kind of plays a role. And, and arguably, it, it, one, says a lot about the person, um, you know, in terms of how their thought processing works. But it does mm. also say a lot about the environment in which they find themselves. And, and I think that that's more important to talk about because we can easily blame the person for being mm. like, oh, you know, these, these dumb supporters on, on Twitter. But th there's more to it than that. The, the fact that they're mm -hmm. on, you know, these bubbles on Twitter and they're, they're within these, these circles. They're, you know, trying to consistently defend or consistently support or, or fighting against, you know, these, these radical leftists or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, that the environment is kind of shaping which of those available thoughts are going to be coming up first. Right. And I think there's also this inclination, um, and we can talk more about this in terms of bubbles, but uh, bubbles on the internet um, are both formed by your own psychology, but are also encouraged and reinforced by the algorithms that you're essentially subject to on the internet as well. And so you get into the situation where like, say like in the 90s, for example, we can talk about availability heuristic or false confirmation bias being a result of you know like selectively choosing which news stations to watch or which radio stations mm -hmm. to listen to and you have total agency within that paradigm but now we have a situation where as soon as you like you don't even have to enact that behavior like you can behave as unbiasedly as you possibly can but the algorithm is still going to push you into a bubble to promote engagement, to promote profits. And so that's part of one of the, this article that I found, ooh, let's see, it's by, oh man, S-P-O-H-R, Spore? Spore, that sounds Spore? right. That sounds Spore, right. Yeah, Spore. Uh, 2017, fake news and ideological polarization, filter bubbles and selective exposure on social media where they go in and explain that, you know, overall the debate, it's kind of a review article where um, they point to say the availability heuristic um, as being possibly an explanation as to why people get exposed to fake news or believe fake news or, you know, get stuck in their ideological bubbles, but they kind of back up and they're like, well, also it's the fact that these sites where the majority of people get their news are selectively giving them news to begin with. And so you're not necessarily even a active agent when it comes to these biases once you enter the space in the first place. Yeah, because the second you, you know, if you're on Twitter, the second you <clears throat> start following person A, you're going to start getting recommendations for people that they follow. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's much the same as sort of aspects of the YouTube algorithm, that if you're watching a video where someone is debunking a particular conspiracy theory, because that video is about that particular conspiracy theory, you're likely to also get videos, at least to some extent, of, um, you know, about that, that conspiracy is, theory or yeah. people who, who agree with that. Yeah, you'll get the original people who are putting the conspiracy theory out, you'll get the debunkers, and the more you watch, the more the algorithm's like, oh, hey, they just watched like four or five videos in a row on this topic. They must be really into this. Let's send them further. And so it'll start giving you more and more and more and more. Um, that's why I have a whole bunch of cooking recipes popping up in my suggestions right now. Yeah, but but every, um, every month my recommendations shift wildly because I go down a rabbit hole and then I, I go back to watching, you know, a video game Let's Play while I'm typing something. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the tips that I use is essentially treating your algorithm like a dog. Um, you have to give it treats or you have to like let it know when things are not okay using the like and dislike button. 
I know that translates to money for content creators, so it's kind of hard to do that sometimes, but sometimes you have to hit the dislike button. Like yeah. not even just to dislike that particular video, but just so that way the algorithm knows, don't give me other stuff like this. And, and YouTube will let you dismiss Re uh, recommended videos without even having to click on those videos. So if you, <laughs> if it right. definitely is something you don't want to see, um, but again, there's some self selection bias going on mm -hmm. there too. That that you know we are kind of curating our own. Um, you know, in part, I mean, the algorithm is helping with it, but we are slowly curating aspects of our own bubbles of of what mm -hmm. we're being exposed to. So that's kind of the point of the Spore article is to kind of say that we need to like take a step back and move away from this idea that these biases or these um, uh, errors in automatic processing are like personal faults of people on the internet. That that's not necessarily like a moral argument here. It's something that we not automatically do and we have created technology in our own image essentially to uh promote and reinforce those biases that already exist to the point where we really don't have that much control unless we work very very hard to start building that bubble out and that takes a lot of information literacy you've got to know the right keywords um and you've got to be able to like play with the likes and the dislikes on the videos or the posts otherwise it's going to retake back over and send you down a new rabbit hole yeah, I mean, and like with any any textbook discussion on automatic and controlled processing, it, it takes a lot of the controlled side of the processing. It's just, and, and that's mm -hmm. difficult. You know, for the average person, if you're just tired at the end of the day and you want to watch some dang YouTube videos, um, you're not going to be thinking about stuff like that. And, and just in the same way that kind of the thoughts that pop into our head that we don't self-check. Um, mm -hmm. that, 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 you know, and I think this taps in a little more into the next chapter when we get into things like our chapter four, uh, implicit attitudes that, um, you know, it's another good way to, to examine how, you know, someone who has an implicit bias or someone who has these sort of automatic biases or these automatic assumptions that arguably, you know, again, we're, we're not saying that, that it's kind of an inherent fault of the individual. It's, it's the systems that they find themselves in. It's the institutional, Mm -hmm. pressures that are are moving some of the likelihood that they're going to engage in in particular aspects of thought especially on something like twitter where it's just so right. easy to type something real quick and hit tweet and mm -hmm. next next thing you know you're you're in trouble because you said mm -hmm. something you didn't want to say um yeah all of you, a sudden uh, twitter thinks you're an anarchist and there you go <laughs> You know, and, and again, that those misperceptions, that 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 kind of lack of understanding as as to where, um, you know, maybe where that person's tweet is coming from, because it can be difficult. We're not going to go read every tweet that that person has ever uh, sent out. We're not going to go mm -hmm. look at their entire history. Um, I mean, some people do to go find that one tweet, but right, they go mining. <laughs> but even then, like the context and the the kind of background from it, we kind of lose that. I mean, it it it, it also takes us into the realm of uh, one of the two laws of the internet, uh, Poe's oh, law. Man. Well, not that, not the rules of the internet. That's a whole nother. But the, oh, the two, I gotcha. Yeah, the the two laws that were developed from the internet: Poe's law and Godwin's law. And so Godwin's law which has been tested, shows that the longer an argument goes on, the closer you hit an inflection point where someone calls someone else a Nazi. Um, right. Or brings up the Nazis or something like that. And so Nazis will be brought up at some point. Godwin's mm -hmm. law. But Poe's law says is that anything on the internet is uh, uh, any factual or meaningful statement on the internet is indistinguishable from satire. Right. And, and so like with the NPR tweets. Uh, there's mm -hmm. there's a there's a subreddit called "They Ate the Onion," and <laughs> it, it, it's it's people getting upset on social media at Onion articles or or satire right. articles because unless you know to specifically look for the Onion or to specifically look for you know that particular you know who's tweeting this out is this a satire account is it is it something like uh, Devin Nunez's cow. Mm -hmm. um, or, or is it a legitimate news account? You know, so if, mm -hmm. if something like if someone like um, David Brooks or Maggie Haberman or, or some of these, uh, the, the, you know, kind of prominent reporters, you know, talking about big political issues, if they're 
sit submitting something, yeah, I, I can generally take it seriously. Um, but if I'm seeing, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't know. I don't, I don't know who, who's the most satirical account, maybe the tweet of God, you know, making some off the cuff yeah. comment uh, about nihilistic Arby's, something like that. Right. You look at it and see the Arby's logo, be like, how dare Arby's say this? <laughs> but it's because we're, we're kind of relying on these automatic processes and, and we're, mm -hmm. we're tapped into it. I mean, especially when we're talking about the media and those influences, we've, we've entered this age of, um, algorithms and and carefully curated content that that's kind of mm -hmm. developed to keep us engaged to keep us clicking so that the companies mm -hmm. make money uh, yep but, get but, that ad revenue but we've based our our, our schemas our, our our shortcuts for how we code a lot of this information in in the same way that you know maybe our parents were watching like walter cronkite on television right. you know he's, he's the most trusted man in america at the time because the, the news that that lawsuit didn't go through that said that the news doesn't have to be news um mm -hmm. that some news can be entertainment specifically mm -hmm. the news company that won that lawsuit um and but even after that before the internet you could still change the channel and have agency over what you were listening to so you could good faith like say oh i'm listening to limbaugh right now well let's go over and see what cnn has to say or right. tune into npr but on the internet you might not even get that automatically updated on your algorithm and if you don't engage with that enough even if you do follow say npr they may not be showing up in your newsfeed. Yeah, yeah, and and then the people who are showing up in your newsfeed may also not be real people. They might be might curated. Yes. Um, you know, if if their avatar looks like you, you might assume that they're real. But it's also mm -hmm. really difficult to distinguish bot from regular person, especially in an age where everyone's retweeting the same stuff and everyone's kind of following very specific talking points. It's sometimes really hard, even then, to be able to distinguish between the bot versus the person behind the mm -hmm. keyboard. And in some cases, they may be behaving exactly the same because of the kind of pressures of the algorithm and what they're being exposed to. It's prompting that real person to act very bot-like. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and this is not new, by the way. Um, this, I think this translates over to our next topic of Edward Bernays. Uh, so Edward Bernays was the double nephew of Sigmund Freud. So his, uh, his mother was Freud's sister and his father's sister was Freud's wife. Okay. I just yeah. it took, took me a second to piece that together. <laughs> um, all this so, education and sometimes I'm still confused by family trees. Uh, family trees are confusing yeah. sometimes they're just bushes <laughs> <laughs> um so Edward Bernays was born in 1891 and he actually died in uh 1995 so he made he made it a good stretch um and he is considered the father of public relations and advertising uh, he developed uh, advertising and propaganda based on Freud's work, um, so early psychodynamic, Freudian psychology, and he called it the engineering of consent. When this is a quote from him, this phrase quite simply means the use of an engineering approach that is action based only through knowledge of the situation and on the application of scientific principles and tied to practices to the task of getting people to support ideas and programs. And so his belief was that the masses of consumers, citizens, whatever he's getting paid to convince, are driven by factors outside of their conscious understanding, and therefore their minds can and should be manipulated by the capable few. Quote, intelligent men must realize that propaganda is the modern instrument by which they can fight for positive ends and help to bring order out of chaos. And so he took very bare bones, Freudian, unconscious, automatic processing, and was able to turn it into 
a method of convincing people of whatever his uh, employer needed him to convince them of. So I have a couple of examples. I, I, I do want to say beforehand that the, like, yes. I, want to, I want to make it very clear if we're talking about kind of the Freudian unconscious is that like the automatic processes that we're talking about are still conscious. You still have to be aware of them. It's kind of mm -hmm. the, reason, the reason why, you know, subliminal messaging doesn't work. Um, right. That, that we still have to be aware of them, that they're not unconscious in the Freudian sense, but they're kind of, he's, he's kind of tapping into that idea, though, that, that we have mm -hmm. these. It's a very rudimentary the, version of what we're talking about. Bits of, of thought that we're not maybe as consciously or as actively processing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you just need to kind of get the idea that people have automatic processing. You don't necessarily need a list of 135 biases in right. order to persuade people. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, and this was very, very successful. Um, one of my favorites, by far, of his stories was from the 1920s, where he was charged with getting women to smoke in public, like smoke cigarettes in public. And so he merged and got the feminists on board to start calling cigarettes torches of freedom. And so he had a group of women's rights activists light up lucky strikes in New York City on an Easter Day parade for newspapers and photographers labeling them as torches of freedom. And that enabled the social situation, the environmental norms to shift so that way cigarette companies could now sail to women who would then smoke them in public. But they ran into a problem because at the time, green was a very unfashionable color for some reason. And Lucky Strikes? Lucky Strikes packaging was green. So to overcome this, Bernays hired and convinced both reporters, fashion designers, people who own clothing outlets, and magazine editors to feature green one month out of the year and 1934 became the month that green, the year that green became fashionable because he orchestrated everyone to have the availability to see green in a fashionable context, thus making it perfectly fine to carry around a box of Lucky Strikes in your purse, increasing sales. I'm I'm groaning heavily um, away <laughs> from the away from the mic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I was I was engaging in a bit of an overview of uh, Chomsky, uh, uh, co-authored the book The Manufacturing of Consent, which mm -hmm. is kind of the antithesis response to all of this by basically saying, this is all this stuff that's going on. This is, you know, the, the, these are the systems that are ultimately impacting, um, you know, the individual and, um, you know, this is what we need to be aware of and kind of fight against it. Mm -hmm. and l leave it to advertising i have a couple more examples let's see i have oh yeah no these are all very intense um he was put in charge of convincing america to put fluoride in the tap water and that is why we have successfully they successfully put fluoride in the tap water was bernays was able to because at the time there was a bunch of lawsuits relating to cancer and fluoride and so his marketing campaign was able to overcome those scientific studies in order to get the chemical put into the water I'm, I'm to sorry. shift public opinion. And, 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 you know, like when, when you, when you hear, you know, people throwing a fit about fluoride in the water, you know, kind of like conspiracy theory level mm -hmm. stuff, it's now making me question everything I thought I knew. About it. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we're, we're talking about the twenties versus the 2020s. Um, right. So, I mean, maybe we, we, we've come a little further with that, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, that, the fluoride in the cancer was in, like, 1920s, 30s research, so it's not necessarily relevant, only in the fact that it turned people off to fluoride, and they were not about to let the government put fluoride in the water until the government hired uh, Bernays. I mean, it at least makes me... It gives me, I guess, an appreciation for the people who are still against it, that... Mm -hmm. they're there's, old school there's a reason i mean it, it's coming from a long history of we didn't trust it then there was this this propaganda that was utilized to get people on board and now we still don't trust it 
mm-hmm. maybe because of the propaganda. We kind of recognize it for what it is, even though it might not really be a relevant argument to make. Right. Yeah, no, we're not making a case for or against fluoride in the water <laughs> right now. <laughs> Just the method by which it got into the water in the first place. Yeah, b- big fluoride doesn't pay us enough. <laughs> At all. <laughs> At all. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, oh, he also engineered the traditional American breakfast of bacon and eggs. So in uh, the 20s and the 30s, mostly people were drinking coffee, maybe having an orange, a little bitty snack, and then running off to work. And that was hurting bacon and egg sales, and they needed to figure out a way to get people to consume those products more. And so he paired a letter from 5,000 doctors encouraging people to eat larger breakfasts with a whole bunch of adverts for bacon and egg companies all on the same newspaper page. And that then developed into the traditional American breakfast. So arguably that that he's created basically a hundred year prototype for Mm -hmm. the standard American breakfast. And, and I I don't think the book goes into this, but you know, kind of the idea of the the prototype being the kind of quintessential, what do most people think of when they think of X, you know, librarian, cheerleader, professor, whoever it may be, breakfast. If you think of that. Bacon and eggs. That is engineered. I don't know. I, 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 can't, I can't give it up, but I, uh, I don't oh, know yeah, how I no. feel about it Bernays anymore. is dead. I don't care. It's wonderful. <laughs> I actually had that for breakfast today with a little bit of steak. I mean, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, getting people to see bacon and eggs is, and breakfast is, is maybe the least offensive type of propaganda that he's throwing out. Yeah. Let's see. Two more examples. Um, he worked with Procter and Gamble uh, for their ivory soap brand and convinced people that ivory soap was medically superior to other soaps. And so if you have that knee-jerk reaction that maybe ivory soap is more hygienic or kills more germs and stuff like that, that was engineered by Mr. Bernays. He also invented uh, carving soap boats and having soap boat competitions for floating as a way to demonstrate that ivory soap floated better than the competitors. And lastly, we're gonna get real Freudian here. (laughs) He worked for Dixie Cup and promoted the idea that uh, Dixie Cups and throwaway cups were more hygienic than washable ones by pairing uh, reusable cups with images of vaginas and venereal diseases in advertisements. I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> and and like it just makes me think. I, I was recording some of my lecture on I guess what we'll get into in chapter four for advertisement and, and subliminal messaging with like the absolute vodka ads. You know, you get into like once once we move in to I guess more modern advertising, there's almost an offensiveness if you want to do something to the point where people were claiming to see sexual, mm-hmm. ex- sexually explicit content in a, in a glass of vodka that didn't exist. Um, right. In this case, he was just like, eh, we'll do it. We'll just. Yeah, just do it. Like, throw these the images same page right in the there. newspaper, like, put a little ad about venereal disease warnings, and then right above it, put in a little ad about Dixie Cups being Dixie Cups, <laughs> Dixie Cups being more hygienic than regular cups and then you get that pairing that association builds and then now we all use throwaway cups i i definitely want to put a pin in in some of this and come back to it when we get to chapter four because there there's a lot in the advertising side there's a lot in the persuasion and like especially pairing and, and how much attention you're paying to these these concepts that, that basically that entire chapter is about um, you know, especially when we're talking about, you know, if, if it's something like that, and we're not paying a whole lot of attention to it, that, that, that it can have a bigger effect on us because we're making that pairing. We're still conssciously consuming all of that, but we're not, mm-hmm. we're again, and we're, we're also not, taking it in good faith too. Right. Yeah. The, kind of there, like the algorithms. And, and there was a, there was a big thing in, in the, I haven't noticed I at least haven't noticed anyone writing a whole lot on it recently, um, but occasionally that'll come up when the, like a news article becomes really popular, and then you find out after you get about halfway through it, it's an opinion piece, yep. um, 
or with that, uh, what do they call it? I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose it. Uh, but it's kind of like a targeted advertising, um, where one of the more famous ones was, uh, there was this, this really big write up on, um, women in the prison system and it was sponsored by, um, the 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 individuals who were were putting out orange is the new black oh i got and you. and so the idea is is that you'd be reading about the stuff that's going on in the the prison system predominantly women's prisons and you know again there might be some little advertisements or something on the uh the website mm -hmm. but unless you were reading the fine print you wouldn't realize that this was directly paid for you know producers mm -hmm. and 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 the, the kind of rights holders to orange is the new black where you know that's ultimately what they want you to think about they want you to think like hey this is kind of interesting i want to know more about what's going on in a women's prison hey there's this right. new show that's out it just started mm -hmm. its second season maybe i should watch that and this also kind of gets to, I think, back to kind of like the news, one of the things that drives me crazy. And I understand why people do this, but it's when they only read headlines. And they'd only read headlines because in the back when there was like newspaper news, well, I mean, there still are newspaper newspapers. Yeah. But when that was the primary mode of information, you could just scan the headlines, look for something that's interesting. Usually it was something that like the core information was right there. You had your first paragraph that told you exactly what that article was going to be about. And then you could keep moving on if it wasn't interesting. Well, now in our world of clickbait, where people make money based on the number of clicks an article gets and how many eyes get on the ads in the article, people still have not adjusted to not just scanning and reading the headlines because the headlines are purposefully misleading to make you think, oh, what's going on over there? And instead they just get the, oh, so-and-so said something terrible. Well, I, I obviously know what that's about. And then they keep moving on instead it's, of clicking on it. It's developed my hatred for words like uh, so-and-so roasted so-and-so. <laughs> right. You will not believe. Nancy Pelosi destroys Donald Trump. Like, I, I doubt it. Um, I, I doubt I mean, it. Literally, it's not happening. Um, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, like, like how it's, it's written like that. Um, you know, I, I can look at, um, you know, I, I follow a couple of kind of like, uh, news related subreddits and I'm usually not clicking on a whole lot of stuff unless I, I see it and I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. I want to know more about this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go into the article, but but yeah, I mean, part of it too isn't just that it's it's about the clickbait. Part of it is also about the sheer amount of mm -hmm. articles being written on the same stuff. Of this this kind of need for a twenty four hour news dialogue. You know, back back. You know, I mean, on one hand, there has been benefit to a consistent exposure to social media. I mean, we could argue that like even our automatic perceptions and understandings of, you know, aspects of like the protests or, or, you know, you know issues with, um, you know, combating police violence, um, in, in, in some of these communities that, that we wouldn't be exposed to any of that in, mm. um, in a world where we're only getting our news an hour every night. Um, right. Or it'll be very limited. I mean, it's not like the news wasn't covering things like the LA riots or, or, you know, the, these, these massive protest movements, but they weren't covering it as much. Or other people weren't able to kind of step in and say, you know, hey, these people aren't covering it, covering it we're going to cover it. Um, mm -hmm. But th the downside of that is because we're bombarded with so much information at any given point, we have to, again, make that balance between automatic versus cognitive processing or, or the, the kind of, um, I think Kahneman calls it analytic versus heuristic processing. Um, right, and and yeah. so that, that heuristic quick response action of saying like, well, that's an interesting headline. I'm going to move on uh, versus mm -hmm. more carefully thinking about it because, you know, if we've only got 20 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes before a class to kind of skim through what's going on on Twitter, we're limited. We can't go in and read that, 10 page New York times article that, that breaks down like the entire history of this, this, this momentous event or kind of pulls records from all these different sources. 
we don't have time for that in the same way that that why we tend to fall back on these automatic associations this it's kind of lumping together things like dixie cups and everything else um venereal diseases yeah <laughs> that uh that that what we end up with is we, we don't have time to think about it and so we mm -hmm. make those quick associations we kind of plug them into the back of our brain and then we move on to the next thing um mm -hmm. and and so when you find have the energy either right that that everything we do takes conscious energy and that's mm -hmm. i mean when we really think of the kind of evolutionary nature of why we have these automatic processes is that 99% of the time or for 99.9% .9 of all human history they have been 100% generally beneficial or 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 beneficial that they've helped us to quickly assess friend from foe danger from safety um, you know good from from bad you know what what what, what can I eat and what do I need to avoid um, how can I leave the house with everything that I need <laughs> without thinking about it every single time Right. And, and so these processes that have developed over the course of human history um, have, have basically left us with a set of tools that are really effective in, in very quickly processing our environment, but also... Very susceptible to manipulation. Right. Um, because again, I mean, you know, if we're going back to our ancestors, my ancestor who just needed to quickly listen to the authority figure that said, you know, don't go play in the river because it's, it's fast and it'll, you'll die, you'll drown. Don't eat those berries. They're poisonous. And in those woods, there are tigers. I'm like, yes, the authority is right. And then I mm -hmm. live and I get to have children, um, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to the person who doesn't listen to the authority. But, but, but in a world where we have this, this broader understanding of psychological, uh, of psychological processes and propaganda techniques, that same thing, we're like, hey, look, I'm wearing a fancy suit. I'm on a respectable news station. You know, just like Walter Cronkite. Look at Cron my calm tone. Just like Walter Cronkite from 30, 40 years ago. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, listen to me. I'm, I'm a trustworthy source. And, and so we have this, this blurred line especially amongst older individuals that grew mm -hmm. up with people like Walter Cronkite, that they can see someone in that suit with a calm demeanor, acting much like a Cronkite or a Dan Rather, I'm trying to remember some other famous new news individuals. Um, back when I used to watch the news with my dad uh, and not just- Or even just like the sense that, oh, they're published, it must be legitimate. I read it online. Like they don't just let anyone publish an article. Yeah, <laughs> like they did in the you know nineteen uh, 1900s. Like you know, you had to go through gatekeepers, and now you can just set up a blog. And I mean, and arguably, they look professional. And arguably, if we're pub trying to publish stuff in a legitimate journal, we still have to go through the gatekeepers. Right, but those gatekeepers charge <clears throat> quite a lot of money usually, and your grandma's not going to get to read that article. Right, they're, they're, they're going gonna... to read the blogger who writes about the article. Or just comes up with their own conspiracy mm -hmm. theory or own idea of what's really, really going on. So there's a lot, like the environment of the 21st century makes our automatic processes very, very complex and very susceptible in a way that I don't think humans had necessarily had to deal with at this level before. Yeah, I and mean, there are ways that we can get better at it, um, mm -hmm. but it takes, again, it takes energy, it takes effort, it's, it's kind of a never-ending process. Um, I definitely want to bring him up when we get to talking about prejudice, but uh, part of a book club over the summer, I read Imbra Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, and kind of the two things that, out of the many things that I took, but the two things I think that relate most to kind of what we're talking about is uh, one, he, he has a lot to say about the individual versus the system. And that's mm -hmm. that an individual can engage in racist activity, but that racist activity or that racist thought or that racist idea is, is tied in part to the environmental systems in which they live. Uh, right. They, they have to learn it somewhere, arguably. That, that, it, that they're not born with these inherent biases to start throwing out racial slurs and, and hating, um, you know, to the point of wishing harm upon another group of people. Um, mm -hmm. And 
that that it's important to kind of take that into context too that that and as well if we're talking about these automatic system that automatic system that creates the schema these mental shortcuts that we have about groups objects everything come from an adaptive place you know this idea mm -hmm. that that if it barks and it's on four legs it's a dog i can easily identify that or that 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 we do develop stereotypes like if I need to move, I shouldn't go talk to my 90 year old grandmother with osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. If I need to, to, to deal with a mortgage interest rate advice, I'm not going to go talk to a 10 year old. And, and so, you know, they, they come from a place where they benefit us, but they can be twisted. They can be influenced by other sources. They can be influenced by just incorrect information. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other side is, is that, to, to be an anti-racist, to be someone who is kind of actively working against systems of oppression or at least actively aware of their own behavior. You know, not, not a, well, I'm not a racist. I would never do something like that. Kind of argues against, you know, the point, well, like, no, the way our automatic processes work is that you may not consciously and deliberately, but you might still be influenced in, in ways mm -hmm. which you might not be aware. And so it's a constant cognitive process. It's work. And again, you know, if you're working two jobs, if you're busy, if you've got a bunch of other stuff going on, you might not be able to keep a lot of these processes in check. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, no, that's a huge ask for someone to like constantly be monitoring which <laughs> processes are automatic and which ones are holistic like even without the internet that's still like you can't yeah and and, and I, I can't again remember off the top of my head if it's this particular textbook or a previous I've, I've gone through so many social psych textbook textbooks i think i'm hitting my 10th year teaching this course um that uh they, they talk about ways that we can overcome it and there's research that shows that that you know things like being humble like, just be willing to admit that you can be wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> that you might not have all of the information. Um, it can be tough because that usually means taking a hit to our self-esteem. And that is the most important thing. And we'll get into that next chapter <laughs> and the next chapter. And I think the next chapter um, that, uh, but, but also things like uh, they found that like statistics classes, and if you're completely against statistics classes, you don't have to take a full class. Mm -hmm. just, just sitting in a lecture that talks about thinking critically and, and hypothesis development and the scientific method and these things like that to kind of think about, all right, so this thing is happening. Why is it happening? Can I put that to the test in some way? Can I try to think critically about why it's happening as opposed to just saying it's... It's just how those people are. It's just how this event mm -hmm. is, or it's just the way things are. Um, Essentializing it. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the things that stood out to me with uh, statistics in particular and why people should know it, just generally across the board, just very basic stuff, is and why it's so hard for people to learn it, is that it kind of goes against all of these automatic processes that we have to understand quantities and numbers and uh, frequencies and stuff like that. If you introduce statistics into it, then all of a sudden you're working with a math structure that's not a part of your automatic processing. And so by learning it and ingraining it, you can incorporate it into your automatic processing and kind of give yourself an upgrade. But it's like pulling teeth. Like I even had a hard time in my first stats class. It was terrible. Yeah, I mean, even getting into something like basic probability. <laughs> yeah, no, probability just... <sighs> And again, it's, it's not, like, when you really look at it, it's not all that difficult. No, it's just trying it, to figure it, out a way to integrate it. To, to kind of wrap it, you know, to, to so I, I, I can actually, <clears throat> um, while we're talking about this, there's, uh, so I have my entire class take Daniel Kahneman's three question CRT test. I don't know if you've okay. ever had the pleasure of taking Daniel Kahneman's I have not. CRT are, are you test. About to embarrass me on this podcast? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I once asked my wife these the, these three questions, and um, she got really upset at me. Um, I, I also, for a research study, asked an in, uh, predominantly freshman research pool these three questions, uh -huh. and I had, I had to throw out all the data. Really? 
because the average freshman either either got all three wrong or refused to answer any of them and just quit out the survey. Oh no. <laughs> So, so, so the idea behind these is, is that Kahneman created these kind of three questions and, and basically they're tied to heuristic versus analytic thinking. Okay. And so, um, oh, I'm trying to find it. Um, and, and so yeah, they're related to, to heuristic versus analytic thinking. And so the idea is, is that when you, you hear this question or you read this question, the first thought that pops into your head is essentially the heuristic response. Okay. And it's wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the correct response is when you actually try to put some thought into it. And so it, it's meant to trigger that automatic process. Um, it's, it's meant to trigger uh, those particular uh, like heuristics that, that focus on getting you to come up with a really quick answer, a really quick response, and, um, and, and, you know, the incorrect one. So I, I feel like your my, comment about being humble is foreshadow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I, I give this to my students every semester for, cog, uh, when I teach cognitive psychology, I give it to them as well. When I do social cognition, the vast majority of them absolutely hate it um, because it as, as you'll see at mm -hmm. some point you're going to think these are trick questions all right so um so here's the first one uh, oh man here I'm, i'll actually i'll share my screen with you so that you can see okay a bat and a ball cost one dollar ten in total the bat cost one dollar more than the ball how much does the ball cost now, in, in the actual research study, you're, you're only supposed to give your participants a, about 15 to 30 seconds to answer this. Like, not a whole lot of time. You're supposed to see the question. You're supposed to process it. You're supposed to come up with an answer and then move on to the next one as quickly as possible. Um, and, and scoring high on this tends to relate to things like need for cognition and oh. a, a bunch of other positive analytical thinking type traits. So they, no, no pressure. No, no pressure. <laughs> no not pressure. At all. So, um, so this one, so I can tell that the automatic <laughs> response is that the ball would cost 10 cents. Right. Yeah. So if you say a bat and a ball cost a dollar 10 in total, the bat costs a mm -hmm. dollar more than a ball and than the ball, you, you, you would have immediately that... go, Oh, the ball's 10 cents then, but that's only right. 90 cents more. And so right. you have to like work your way back. Okay. I don't have a, and in paper on me to actually do that math. Um, okay. uh, what is it, like 85? Uh, the ball costs five cents. Five cents, yeah. yeah and so a dollar more than five cents is a dollar five. Right. Okay. And, and they add to a dollar ten. So okay, that's clever. That's, yeah. So like it's, it's meant to, to jog, it's meant to force that heuristic response out. And actually one of the ways that you test this is you, um, you have them do it by hand so you can actually see if they are raced. Um, oh, nice. Like, so there are these little things that you can do. Um, I, I, did, I did mine predominantly digital when I did it, so I didn't really have that. <laughs> but I could see how long it took. I, I did like, you know, I used a timer. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, second... If it takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? Uh, so if it takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, how long would it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? So the automatic processing would be 100 minutes. Yes, so you see 555. Five, five. Mm -hmm. and, and you're you asked 100 yeah. blank 100 and so you fill it in with 100 that's that's the heuristic response and that's wrong right oh man i don't even know what the answer to that would be um is it like 20 or something you're way or is off. it five it's five is it five yeah it's five yeah yeah so it, it it doesn't matter how many machines you have it will it will always take one machine five minutes to make one widget 
Right. So then it would have to be, yeah, because you're, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, if okay. it said something like, I had 20 machines, how many minutes does it take to make 100 widgets? Like, that would be a little different, but that wouldn't trigger the that hu- sort heuristic of. response. Okay. And I then, like these. and then my favorite. In a lake, there's a patch of lily pads. Every day, the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half of the lake? Patch of lily pads, it doubles in size every day. Oh, oh, 48 okay. days to cover so the entire lake. How the automatic would be 24 days. Right. But that's actually it would take 47. Exactly. Yeah, because it has to, to fill the lake, it needs to double. And so it would be half, yeah. So I yes. like that one. Yeah, so I, I, I give these to students every semester just to get the groans, just to see how they respond to it. And um, generally what happens is, is that some of them get it, some of them don't. I get accused of um, trick questions. Uh, it, it's, I think, I think if, if you really want to try your hand at explaining something very, what is arguably very simple, to mm-hmm. a group of students, but not being able to try to explain the answer to these questions to someone who just doesn't get it. And, oh, and, it, and, and again, it's because, you know, again, if you're sitting in a class, the, the worst class I ever did this with was at 8 a.m. Oh, um, and it was, it was a, always, they were running on automatic that whole hour. And it was a research design class. So it wasn't, you know, Those as exciting. And I was like, here, here are three questions. My heart breaks for them. And again, Why would they do that? Who wants to think? Who who wants to? And and I empathize. Like who I don't wants even to, want think to be at conscious at eight a.m.? I'm not even conscious. <laughs> and so, but but it it does help to emphasize like you know how we think differently or how these automatic processes can override, especially. And I think the eight a.m. class is a great way to show this, especially if we're tired. Mm -hmm. especially if we're worn out especially if we've you know stayed up late studying or not studying or trying to avoid schoolwork at all costs um it it, then your snotty professor shows up with these questions (laughs) right like what a jerk um and and so right and 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 usually i don't do that on the first day of class because i want them to build a schema of me i want them to, to generate a decent first impression of me before i start throwing stuff like this at them Mm-hmm. And try to spend so the first more forgiving, right? I mean, hopefully, you know, try try to be a little more uh, kind and, and empathetic for the first couple of days, <laughs> and then you hit them with the hard questions. It's, oh right. man, that eight o'clock class period is so hard. They are never amused, except yeah. for the back to school moms. They're always amused, and they're there <laughs> at eight and they're ready, but nobody else is. I mean, there's a sort of difference, and, and you know, and again, like how we view those, how we as instructors uh, view those students, how those students mm-hmm. view us. Yeah, look at that automatic um, processing. And that, that's actually uh, one of the things that, that makes me think about is, um, you know, I, I, like, I like to, one, you know, try to find ways in which the, I can connect, you know, like doing really poorly your first semester in college, because you, again, have this, this assumption, this bias, this schema about what school is like. And that is based on elementary school and high school. Mm-hmm. And then you come into a college class. And, oh, yeah, and everything gets thrown out the window and you're like, oh, my high school or teachers didn't actually know what they were doing when they were preparing me for college. I, I wasn't prepared for this. I mean, you know, yeah. And, and we can do, I mean, I could arguably see the same when I was moving from undergraduate to graduate school. Um, you know, again, my perceptions and my, my understanding of what I was going to get into Mm-hmm. It was a rude, rude awakening that first semester. Um, and then I think we also see the same when we finally leave, like you know, getting mm-hmm. a teaching job. Can you get a teaching job? Um, you know, <laughs> a number of these issues that, 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 you know, how are things going to be? You know, if someone told me that a chunk of my time as a professor was going to be sitting in committees, I, th- I had some idea, but again, mm-hmm. it didn't, didn't really process as well. Um, Luckily, I kind of live for some of the political action, but um, mm-hmm. it's it's definitely not, you know, again, it's, it's that, that kind of automatic perceptual guess of what it's going to be like versus what it's actually going to be like. That was kind of what I went through when I was going from high school to college because I was homeschooled. And so my family and I were like hyper anxious and way over prepared me for college. 
because we had no idea what was going on in like public high school or what would be expected of in college for like the 21st century. And so I showed up and I was like way over prepared. And I was like, oh, this is not at all what I thought it was going to be. I can relax. Like, not like relax, relax, because there's nothing relaxing about it. But when you go in expecting boot camp, yeah, it's a little then, bit different. Yeah, and the same can definitely be said when we hear stories about other professors, when we hear uh, both good and bad. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've had people come into my class hearing a bunch of easy stories. Uh, I've gotten some really interesting responses on my student evaluations. <laughs> Um, concerning the difficulty of some of my classes, I never know where I stand semester to semester. Uh, but yeah, I usually scare mine terribly with my assignments. And then by the end of it, they love me. And then the next round of people come in thinking like, oh, Thomas is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. And then they read my syllabus, if they read my syllabus, and then go, oh, I'm going to be writing for the next five months straight. And 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 again, like a lot of that is is kind of perceptual too, like how we view certain, uh, my master's thesis professor is infamous at the university. I not only um, got my master's degree, but taught at for several years. Um, when I heard stories about how he ran the first day of class, I was shocked because it's just not, not the guy I knew. Um, mm -hmm. Not, not the sort of kind of partially laid back, um, you know, willing to help. It was a real stickler for writing. Mm -hmm. But, but like my perceptions of them were very different than when I had a student was like, like, you don't understand. And I'm like, well, like what's going on? And they're like, well, he comes in the first day of class and he goes like, I don't care about you. You don't care about me. Like, you're just here to get through the class, <laughs> like puts them through the ringer. But, it, but arguably too, like, I think part of his understanding of that is it kind of sets the student up to like, if you're going to come and bother him, it, it's going to be for a good reason. Now, I'd argue right that that's probably scaring students away. And I, I can't see myself doing that. I can't go into a class and start yelling at students. I also don't have tenure. <laughs> right. See, I, my approach has always been like, go in and I'm like the super chill, laid back, like, hey guys, how's it going? Super encouraging, um, real quiet. And then when I get to the comment section of their papers I completely change tone and scare the living daylights out of them and then they come back the next day and they're like I got an A but I don't understand your comments why were you so mean and I'm like don't worry about it man like these are just like edits suggestions make sure you do all of them okay okay <laughs> but I mean there, there's that perceptual difference like their their kind of impression and understanding and the aspects of their Thomas schema uh, mm -hmm. is does not include you know Gordon Ramsay style comments on a paper right <laughs> and, and then when it happens it it arguably <laughs> kind of probably takes them out of that heuristic mindset and brings them into that analytic and going wait a second I have to think about this for a second mm -hmm. and that's what, why I schedule mandatory happened? meetings with me right after I give them their first round of feedback yeah. I'm like we're not letting you just like run away after this like you gotta come into the office now no matter how good you did. So one of the things that this kind of brings me to, and I guess what we can end this on is, is maybe to pick a couple, maybe we'll do yeah. three. Um, this big sheet of biases. The big sheet of biases. Can we post this? Do we need to give credit to this? Yeah, this is a Jennifer Mann. Um, oh, she, okay. I've had a class with her. She's real cool. Yeah, so, so when given the option to do a final paper, she proposed this. And um, it's probably the coolest thing that I picked up from grad school. And like, you know, out of, out of everything I got from grad school, this 136 list of biases that has uh, the, the name, the author and researcher um, credited, and the year, if, if they were able to find it, a description, and then any other name it went by. So something like the first, and they're, and they're all in alphabetical order. So like the, act, the actor observer bias, Jones and Nisbet, 1972, it's the tendency to judge one's own actions as being caused by situational factors and observing others' behavior as being caused by dispositional factors. It is the fundamental attribution error. And that's in, that's in the textbook. And so 
and it just goes from there. Uh, 16 Excel pages. And yeah, I think I can, I can, I can attempt to post this. Um, uh, maybe I'll turn it into a PDF and, uh, mm-hmm. uh add, make sure we add, give credit to Jennifer Add add author credit. And I wouldn't know how to cite this, but you don't have to necessarily cite this because it's got all the, all the original author's names in there. Right. Well, I mean, also in the new APA, there's ways to cite gray literature now. Cause I think this would qualify right, as gray right. literature. Yeah, definitely. So we can talk definitely. about that later maybe we should do an apa like let's explore the apa handbook oh yeah i i I just recorded a lecture on that for research design it's oh nice oh there you go so intriguing and (laughs) i love the new apa version oh it's great the changes are great i don't uh my my students don't usually like me rambling about apa style for an hour uh 30 minutes (laughs) So, all right. So I'm going to use a random number generator and we're going to pick three of these. So, um, all right. So let's see. You write something down. 108. 108. We'll do them in numerical order. Uh, 30. And 99. Maybe just do an entire podcast on this. Just biases every week. Three, four random biases. Mm-hmm. All right. So 30. 30? Make sure to subtract one since top line is. That's right. Um, I could just go with 30 on this. Disconfirmation biased. Oh, disconfirmation. Lord Ross and Leper, 1979. <clears throat> the tendency to spend more time and effort denigrating contrary arguments than supporting arguments. <laughs> It's kind of the opposite of confirmation bias, where you you spend so much time finding arguments in support of your claim that you ignore anything that contradicts it. Uh-huh. Um, in this case, you're 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 actually trying to put down. So instead of supporting your claims, you just spend time a- attacking the claims of others. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that you could build a YouTube profession off of that. I mean, there are people who already do, <laughs> um, and 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 there is like this this line because there are there are plenty of like like skeptical and debunking YouTubers. There's some great ones out there that that do spend a lot of time saying like this is why this person is wrong, but mm-hmm. also then going and this is the correct information. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I'm, At I'm least a, the ones worth their stuff are. Yes. Yeah. I think I'm gonna have a lot to add to the the comments section of this. I, I'm a I'm a big proponent of Miles Power. He's a he's a chemist. Uh, he's actually worked in the industry, and he does a lot of um, conspiracy theory type, especially revolving around anything like chemical, biological, in in that in that science field. And he he spends a lot of time saying like, this is why the person's wrong. This is the this is what we know about this knowledge. Or here you know here's this article on that that's trying to refute it. You know, and, and gets into a lot of the details, and he's even gone further outside of the chemistry realm. But but he tends to do not just sit there and and denigrate without offering any supporting arguments to your claim. You just sit there, and this makes me think too of, of when we're, we're thinking about this in a modern realm. Because this is 1979. Mm-hmm. That there's that like kind of paradox of of, of bullshit. It's the paradox of the BS paradox that it takes less, it takes more time to dismiss or debunk a BS argument than it does to spew it. Right. And it it almost creates because there are individuals who are trying to kind of push disingenuous messages and they just spout so much Mm -hmm. um, uh, contrary argument. They, They just spout so much garbage you you almost have to engage in disconfirmation bias where you spend right. so much time uh, breaking down their arguments that you don't get to actually offer any support of your own. Right. And that's kind of the tactic you like, they purposely want to corner you into this bias. Yes. Yes. And, and there's so definitely that way, because if you're like, especially if you're on a platform and you're being viewed, if you're stuck, like disconfirming their claims the entire time, you look weak. And and you normalize a lot of their claims without offering any mm. rebuttal of your own. Uh, something something mm. to think about too if someone is making a, what's called a bad faith argument. Um, Usually, my response to that is I've paid thousands of dollars and spent thousands of hours in school 
to understand that this is nonsense and I don't have the time or money to uh, convey all of that to you in the short period of time. And, and when they ask why some scientists do not debate pseudoscientists, I, that's part of the reason why. Yes, I spent too much money on this. <laughs> so 99 is a good one. 99. It's a relevant one. Oh, let's see. Lowenstein, O'Donohue, and Robin. Projection 20, bias. 2003, projection bias. The tendency to overestimate how our future tastes will resemble our current tastes. Oh. Yeah, so, so this isn't like projecting onto other people, which is, I, I think, maybe the more relevant version of this. But this is projecting into the future. Yeah, so kind of like the idea of like, not to like, you know, dismiss our tattoo having wearing friends, but the idea that you're always going to love the tattoo because you've picked the one that will be meaningful for you for the rest of your life. And yeah, you probably will like it for the rest of your life, but also that's kind of a bias to assume that you will always like it for the rest of your life. Yeah, Sponge SpongeBob um, riding a ballistic missile with a cowboy hat. Gonna be That's the your best. tattoo? No, I don't have any. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to think of something completely ludicrous. Um, An anchor. <laughs> and, but that's not necessarily ludicrous. Um, I, 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 uh, I worked with a guy who had some naval experience and he had some tattoos. There you and go. a lot of them had meaning. Um, now, maybe he might look back upon that 20 years from now and, and say otherwise but um, but kind of the idea is that you would project into the future that oh future me is gonna love this yeah yeah and I mean even thinking back to you know when we were 10 or 15 or 20 and going oh I'm gonna love this thing forever or I'm, I'm mm -hmm. gonna be a, I'm gonna be a fan of this thing forever <laughs> when I grow up I want to be a doctor and now I'm here and I don't want to be a doctor <laughs> It's too late. It's um, it's too late. <laughs> uh, what's that? What's that? Uh, that that that's another particular bias. That's a, well. It's a sunk cost fallacy. You, oh you, right. You've, the... you've already you've already put too much into it. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to rationalize. That's chapter yep. six. That's chapter six. Well, no, we'll that's uh, chapter four. Chapter four. We'll get to that. Is everything in chapter four? Just about it's, it's attitudes. Oh, attitudes. Um. Uh. uh I can't think of his name now. Um, uh, attitudes, cognitive dissonance theory, persuasion. Yeah. It's, okay. Yeah. It's so a, we're just going to rehash this conversation again in two it's, chapters. It's a big. It's a big. Uh, it's a big chapter. Yeah. All right. One. One thirty. One thirty. There's so many. Oh, time, and time saving bias. No citation. Let's see. Oh, <laughs> the tendency to underestimate the time saved by speeding up and overestimate the time lost by slowing down when you're driving <laughs> or completing, that's, completing tasks. Because if you're that's going, hilarious. if you're going too fast, you might make more mistakes and thus you don't save any time in the long run. Or yet, yes, you're speeding, but you're hitting every red light along the way. <laughs> So you've been out to commerce and so you've driven up the 24 where you go from like 75 miles an hour to a red light. Yes. And so that's like the most, that's the iconic in terms of this bias because people will go 85, 90, a hundred past me going 75, mm -hmm. like they're saving time. And then inevitably all of us are still sitting at that red light when we get into commerce. Because by the time it turns green, I've already caught back up with them, and they've saved zero time. It only matters if you're traveling, like, more than 100 miles in distance, really. Yeah, and, and I mean, even just when it comes to basic tasks, uh, there's, there's, and again, it depends on the task, and we'll probably talk about that at some point. Um, you know, things like uh, social facilitation that, that you know, easy tasks we can rush through because it's like rote memory we we've done it so much it's it's not that big of a deal um it also makes me think of uh just the um planning fallacy it's it's that planning bias where we over we always overestimate how long it's going to take us so, yeah we're totally we're totally only going to do a one hour podcast it's, i don't know oh yeah no we are now 45 minutes uh, max <laughs> 
or if I'm going to, I'm going to sit down and, and, you know, type this, you know, this couple of paragraphs up, it's, it's only going to take me a couple of hours and three days later, I'm still working on it. Um, oh so. yeah. I had to, what was it clean? I had to do the APA section, the reference section for a book chapter that we just submitted. And I was like, Oh, it's only 11 pages. I can wipe this out in two hours. I was up all night. Yeah. <laughs> I did not get done until 7 a.m. <laughs> so always, always extend the amount of time it's going to take you. But again, we're not normally thinking rationally or mm -hmm. an analytically when it comes to uh, some of this stuff. So, so yeah, yeah, we could definitely maybe come back to a couple. I'll, I'll go through the list again and maybe see if we could plug some in in some other chapters. But, uh, oh, yeah, no, we should I'll, do I'll like, definitely what's make our random available. bias of the episode? A random bias, yeah, yes, that would be a good, a good running, running bit for the the podcast is the the bias of the week, or the bias the bi of the episode. I like it. So, so on that note, I, I think we've covered a lot today. Um, we've yes. covered, uh, you know, perceptions of tweets, tweeting the Declaration of Independence covered advertisements we've we've expanded on i think a lot of what the chapter gets into in regards to uh, automatic versus controlled thinking talked about some biases um, how our and, automatic thinking is manipulated and so we're going to take that a step further next week uh, and get into uh, the self Mm. And so aspects of self-identity, how the social environment constructs the self. And, and on our list, we, we have some stuff on fandom identity, which we'll get into as well in later chapters on group, self-censorship, and cringe. Ooh. Which in itself makes me cringe a little bit every time I say the word cringe. Cringe. Um, <laughs> it's, it's one of those words that sounds like it is yes it's, it's like uh, moist it's, i'm sorry to all the listeners who are triggered by moist i'll stop saying so, moist now that in itself is cringe <laughs> um and so we'll kind of get into the nature of of why we experience some of these things how we perceive aspects of the self how we engage in levels of self-awareness and talk about some uh, you know, applicable concepts in relation to how we view ourself in a number of, of, of different ways. And so, so until then, this has been the, the Psychosocial Distancing Podcast. Um, I'm Daniel Chadvorn. I'm Thomas Brooks. And uh, good night, good day, good whenever you're listening to this. Yeah, whenever. Goodbye. <laughs>